Yeah. An NFB understand some of these detailed terms. It's not that important if you get all the details. <coughs> it's what is important is this concept that we have to we have to live in this very very broad, sophisticated and complex uh, environment, <coughs> a stack that, that, we, that we can think of. And Onos is a piece, as you'll see in a minute. It's an important piece, but it's, it's just one piece. So if we look at the entire architecture, this is straight from the Etsy NFB group, the group that defined network functions virtualization. And these VNFs, these, these things here, these are all the functions, virtual firewall, router, or it could be security, it could be whatever we Im implemented in hardware, remote access, and there's an there's unlimited number of these. This is what we're talking about. But, but in order to make a workable service, we have to connect them <coughs> some way. And, and to do that, we need to think about another architecture, which is, um, this is the ONF SDN architecture, the Open Networking Foundation, who many years ago created this three-layer model that, that has the control layer in the middle, which is where ONO sits, which is where SDN control sits, and where some of the network applications that are going to run in this network environment also fit. There's, there's business applications at the top, and those business applications include orchestration, which, which we'll talk more about. And then there's the infrastructure at the bottom, and the ONF actually was the, uh, they were the, the keepers of the open force specification, for those of you familiar with a programmable, logical switch abstraction and um, an interface for programming the network. Now, we have network functions, we have connectivity. We need something to pull them together, and that's where open orchestration comes in. And, and, and that's what I want to talk about. And this is, um, I want to introduce to you OpenO. This is a new, relatively new, Linux Foundation backed <coughs> open source collaborative project that is focused on actually providing this broader or set of orchestration capabilities that will allow large operators to orchestrate end-to-end -end <coughs> services on top of the network function virtualization or NFB infrastructure, but also tying in the connectivity services provided by SDN and legacy networks. That's, that's what orchestration is really about. It's, about. it's about sitting at the top of the, of the value chain, exposing it to the users who are actually initiating communication services from the top of the stack, from the highest level. You know, I want to. I, I don't want to connect a, a device with IP address X Y Z to another one through a uh, through a uh, carrier Ethernet service and then go over some kind of transport network. That, that's that's the details. That's way down at the bottom. What I want to do is I want to be able to. Uh, I want to have a link and I want to link all my remote offices into the corporate office for an insurance company. And I want to do this so that I can share certain files. I want certain access to be secure. I want other access to be fine with the internet. And, and at that level of communications. OpenO is really built around a concept of bringing together SDN and NFB and, and legacy services. GSO in the middle stands for Global Services Orchestration. The way our architecture is partitioned is that we, we actually have one unified entity that's exposed to the back-end systems for carriers. That back-end that back system can make a request for network capabilities at a, at a fairly high level. But that request has nothing in it about the details. Nothing in it about networks and ports and IPs and anything else and any of technologies. It just talks about the requests and the requirements a user might need in order to support a communication service. And, and let's talk about some of those. Bandwidth is the obvious one. But how about latency? How about I'm, I'm willing to pay that, that we're, we're tele, as, as someone from British Telecom mentioned yesterday, when BT had the Olympics and they're hosting the 100 meter dash, which is a 10 second video clip that everybody in the world's watching, especially in Jamaica, but everybody in the world, everybody else is watching as well. They, they can't afford any glitches. So they're very much willing to pay for, or the video providers or, or video operators are willing to pay for um, whatever it takes 
to make sure that no matter what happens in the network, that service is going to be available. So those are some of the other things. And then, of course, what's the other one? This is the business world, cost. So there's many quality of service parameters, and they have to be translated into things down with the network. Then, <coughs> then GSO, Global Services Orchestrator, sits on top of something called NFB orchestration. That's responsible for orchestrating these virtualized functions. And then SDNO, SDN orchestration, is responsible for the orchestrating the connectivity services. So you take these high-level services and you have to break them down into com component parts so that you can actually now start to work with a, a real-world technology network from the bottom. And um, orchestration is not something we created. We're responding based on some of the, uh, the world's largest operators who have been involved in this project <coughs> for, uh, for several months now. And it, and it actually does not encompass all the capabilities that are required for managing a network like this. That's why we have a, uh, a layer at the bottom. This infrastructure layer is going to have to be uh, something we look at very carefully so that we can actually provide uh, a flexible set of integrations between orchestration and network management systems and element management systems in the legacy network. That there's you know, the vast majority of hardware that's installed fits into that category. New SDN networks. Now, how are we going to do that? We're going to do that through a controller. This is where this is where ONOS fits. And then NFVI stands for NFV infrastructure. This is the virtualized infrastructure, OpenStack and related software that is going to be used to allow virtualized network functions to live in this environment. But what we have to do is put them together. And that's what the, the role of orchestration is. And the only other thing I want to say about OpenO at this level, well, two things. One is that we use a model-driven automation scheme in order to do this. And this is, again, not something that we invented, but this is something we've invested quite a bit in. So what's the idea? The idea is that we want to allow operators to create services without having to go and create software the way they do today. So when you hear that agility is the, the issue, how much time does it take? It's because it takes a lot of work to actually not only define the service, but actually implement that service. But with model-driven automation, we can actually allow the operator to provide a UI and a set of tools. They create a service, and then it gets actually integrated into the system without new software development. So it's a really key part. So Tosca and Yang are standardized modeling languages that are used for this. Tosca at the, the service layer at the top, and Yang more at the lower layers. It approaches a relationship, and we have to implement it in such a way that the two meet. The models from the two different worlds meet, which is the service world that's dealing with the users, and then the infrastructure or the, or the, you know, the technology world, which deals with SDN controllers, devices, um, VM, you know, VMware, or, or OpenStack, or whatever virtualized environment. And then the other point I want to make is that you know we created an integration project as well, like right? like was discussed on the panel. We have to be real. And real means that we have to provide some tools to those who might be interested in this and then build something that allows them to try it out, to be able to demonstrate things internally and externally to customers and management and anybody else, partners potentially. And then we want to be able to use it as a way to learn about what we have and then channel some feedback back into the process so that we fix the problems or we address the functional gaps that don't exist. So we've taken a very holistic view of OpenO and, uh, and have been working with a lot of different um, organizations. <coughs> we have 13 member organizations, but we have a, a number of others who are watching this project to, uh, to actually build the, the platform. This is the, the first release. This is a use case. It's, a, it's very complicated, but it's not so complicated. It's virtual CPE. Does, who knows what virtual CPE is? Have anybody ever heard of it? This is the idea that you take the set-top box, the residential gateway, the little thing you connect your home network to, to the carrier network, you take the software and extract it out, and you virtualize it. This is what the CORD initiative is about, that you keep hearing about in the EOS community. This is, we're going to take the virtual functions that used to sit in the customer's premise, in your house, your apartment, your dorm, wherever you live, and take it, or your business, and then move those into the carrier network. Just a complicated way of doing it. The orchestration sits on top. 
And then these are some of the pieces. We have an access SDN controller that actually controls the network closer to the enterprise customer or residential customer. And then we have a, a WAN controller that deals with the carrier network. And in the first release, Onos, we integrated Onos directly there to control the WAN. Now this should not be a surprise if you're familiar with the, the target use cases. This is what Onos was about, WAN, you know, WAN SDN control. This controller is actually open gateway. And one of the, one of the uh, reasons why we implemented multiple controllers is not because we wanted to go take on more work, is because this project is driven by operators. And this picture is contributed by the world's largest mobile operator with 820 million subscribers. And that, of course, is China Mobile. And China Mobile is driving, you know, has, has, has played a very strong role in shaping the future of uh, OpenOA. And the, and, the, and the platform, even though they're not doing it with a bunch of developers. They're doing it through partners, they're doing it through their own contributions, and they're doing it by, by expressing a backing and then doing what open source does well, and then let the community go and decide on some of the details. And um, what OpenO is, is, is actually doing in this case is it's going to allow for a, um, in a carrier cloud data center, it's going to allow functions to be strung together into services based on many of these communication technologies shown in the bottom, and to do it in an orderly way and an automated way. And then we'll allow for a, a UI, a simple UI, that's going to allow for some of these services to be requested. Now, release one <coughs> doesn't mean we implement the most flexible, generic, it's completely tested, <coughs> bulletproof. I'm not even going to stand in front of you and suggest release one in any software development that actually can achieve that high, high bar. But it is the starting point, and we actually created this release for our developers as, as a way to start iterating and building the process. Even though release one is also not a, uh, a trivial undertaking, there will be over two million lines of code released when we, when we announce this shortly. And, and actually, I'm happy to say we're going to announce it next week, because the release one was, it was, was just released from the uh, technical steering committee, the development team that, that creates an open source project, and we're really excited about that. So I wanted to share that with you today. So there are other use cases as well, but I don't have time really to go over them. I do want to cover some other things. One of the things that, um, if you think about from an ONOS perspective, you might be interested in is, what, well, what is this connectivity services orchestration, and why do you care? These are some of the functions of, of what this SDNO capability is that we've integrated into OpenO. You know, the ability to do on-demand connectivity, to automate that, to look at the life cycle of the connectivity service, to bring it together, to abstract it so that we can actually implement over many different types of networks, many different types of overlays and underlay networks and technologies, we can look at the multi-layer, or a, a new diagram, an interesting diagram with a multi-layer transport network and the kind of control required. We wanted to be able to address carrier class needs for a orchestration and connectivity service. And we also, of course, needed to be able to address network control, you know, SDN control, traditional network control. We want to provide a design time environment, or in other words, tools that allow a service provider, an operator, who's actually interested in deploying a large-scale system like this, the tools so they can actually bring connectivity into the mix. So what does that mean? That means that we have these virtual functions. We may have a firewall, we might have a, uh, a load balancer, we might have a, uh, let's talk about an enterprise application, maybe even a WAM optimization. It's a specialized software program that helps the performance of certain applications running in the enterprise. Well, we have to figure out how to connect them. We have to figure out how to provide access to them without running those on the, at, the, at the end user site. And that's what this connectivity services orchestration is all about. And then, of course, we need to deal with northbounds and southbounds. Only think of it. The, the Onos northbound is the orchestrator southbound. So we have northbounds and southbounds as well. We just have to look at different, the term we've been using in the network world, or the SDN world, is latitudes. Where how high are you up on the stack? And then, of course, it has to be carrier grade scale. That, that's, that's the <coughs> table space to, to get you get this off the door. Now, how does this fit into the broader picture? Well, there's another group. It's, called the, it's formally called the Metro Ethernet Forum. This is the group that changed the carrier network from using 
specific technologies to Ethernet like everybody else. And, and, they, and they've created an $80 billion US uh, annual market for carrier Ethernet equipment and services and the like. It's a huge market. They have actually defined the broader picture. Orchestration is a piece of it, and they want to adopt OpenO, but we also have to deal with NTT, let's say Dye's carrier, who wants to go deal with AT&T because we have a transatlantic service. Well, we're not going to be able to deal with that at the lower levels. We're going to need additional integration for that. So what we've been doing is we've been working with the architecture group for the in math, it's this particular group, so that they can start to implement not just the technology pieces, this is the key, it's the operational pieces. How do you operationalize this? How do you create a service? How do you, how do you reuse a service? How do you actually, how do you actually do something like this? You know, hand off a service from operator to operator when tools have no visibility. You know, AT&T can't see what's in NTT's network and vice versa. It just doesn't work that way. It's completely proprietary and closed. And that's what we're, we're doing with the map. And, and then we look at this project, this is just to give you an idea as of um, this week. Uh, first of all, we have, um, we have a number of different uh, projects that we've created. The timeline is that we formed this project, uh, or we announced the project at, at a big event in, Euro in Europe, in Barcelona, as it turns out, in February. By June, we actually created the project, and release one is, is yesterday. You know, well, it's, it's actually today. It's, it's, it's formally released today. So within less than six months, we have a release that has about two million lines of code. It has seven contributors coming from all over the world. And it has some of the world's largest companies that are behind it. So it's, it's quite an undertaking for that, that amount of time. Next year, we intend to integrate with other open reference platforms, with the deaf <laughs> reference platform, Release two is sometime in the middle of next year. It hasn't been scheduled yet. As a matter of fact, that's next, next week's job. And the last thing I want to share with you is, so what's the role of the Linux Foundation? I mentioned the Linux Foundation. I mean, who's heard of Linux? Of course, everybody. So the Linux Foundation is an organization that's really about collective um, innovation. And collaborative and innovation is really <coughs> focused on bringing together different parties serving as the neutral <coughs> entity. The neutral entity means that when we create a project like OpenO, one company can't just decide they're going to do things the way they want to do things. So that happens in other open source arenas, but it's not going to happen in the Linux Foundation collaborative projects. And as a result, what we also want to do is we want to instill the best practices that we've developed over dozens of projects. And of course, Linux is, is the oldest and largest one, but Linux is, is a special case in some respects. So we look at many, many other projects serving many other industries, and we want to apply those best practices to <coughs> telecommunications. We have infrastructure. Infrastructure means somewhere we got to run all that code. How do we do it? Well, we have we build a CI, CD, you know, continuous integration and um, and deployment <coughs> model or uh, infrastructure that the Linux Foundation hosts. And then we expose access depending on where those engineers are who are actually developing the code. And sometimes they're in one place, sometimes, or largely in one place, and sometimes we have to do something like we do in OpenO where we have multiple sites because of the, the widely distributed nature of the project. And then as, where's David, as he knows, community building is a huge part of this. What is, what is that? That's, that's trying to get to the point where it's a sustainable project. That means we want to get users and contributors together so that they can start to feed on each other as, as, it, as this evolves and, and unfolds over time. And then finally, we want to promote this. I mean, it's not enough to just, just, I have a project but nobody knows about it. That's going to be just the same as in a company where it's not going to, it's not going to be that viable over the long term. Now, the Linux Foundation, the fastest growing area in the Linux Foundation, is um, it turns out it's what we loosely refer to as open source networking. So I just gave you an indication of what some of the major projects are and the architecture functions are. Um, you know, the controller projects, this is a, a network operating system for a switch, analytics platform, OpenO at the orchestration at the top, data plane projects. We also work with these reference architectures and reference implementations like OPNFE, which is a Linux Foundation project, but others as well. 
And we're trying to put this together into a grander vision so that the operators who are thinking about open source, who have to deal with all these different projects, can put it all together. So, um, so with that, I don't, I don't know if we have any time for questions. <coughs> yeah, for okay, so are there any questions on open orchestration? <coughs> open and, uh, yes, in the back. Where did we go over here? It's a reference architecture. Yes. It's, how, it's, how would you compare and contrast from a functional perspective OpenWorld versus Etsy's or, or, or open source management? That's the first time I've ever got that question. I had no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> Seriously, did, what, what is referring to? I'm sorry, what was your name? I, I've done. Oh, I'm sorry. I should know that. Um, OSM, Open Source Nano, is another project, and it goes back to, I'm just going to go back to a slide really quick. And Open Source Nano was focused on this problem, which is, how do I actually manage and orchestrate virtualized network functions? That, that's really how it started. Now, the scope expands a little bit or change, but that's where the architecture is built upon. Whereas what OpenO is trying to do is all these things. That's the simple answer. Now, I, can an I, I want to answer the question from some other perspectives, though, too. I mean, OpenO is a truly global project. It spans, everything we do spans 15 time zones. That's Silicon Valley to China. And actually, guy, we have to work on Japan, so we'll make it 16 time zones when we get Japan into the mix. But right now, we don't have a Japanese member, but we will. The, the, the MANO project, OS Open Source MANO project, has far fewer contributors, and they're more concentrated in Europe. It's not a regional project. Anybody, any Etsy member can join. But right now, if you look at who's actually contributing, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a concentration of European companies. And actually, and actually, some of the companies are even members of Open and Canonical. Right, another way to look at this is, you know, let's talk about openness. Openness is the key. And if you look at open source MANO, where did it actually start from? Well, it started from one major operator in, in, in Europe, and it turns out in Spain, it's Telefonica. Whereas OpenO, it sort of started with, with some companies in China, not just one, but multiple companies in China, but it sort of branched out into a more global project beyond that. But the key is, is that China Mobile, for instance, didn't contribute any code up front, like, not like what Telefonica did to start Open, open source now. So it's a different level of openness, it's a different level of scope, and it's a different level of the way they, they, they choose to operate as a project. And it operates in a standards body, Etsy, you know, there's dozens of pages of agreements you got to sign just to participate, but once you do participate, then it's easy to, to get involved. And then, of course, the Linux Foundation is an open source organization, which is really not encumbered by this, the, the, some of the the um, issues in the standards body, even though even though o we view OSM as a project we want to engage with. We're collaborative. They're part of the community. It's not a competitive thing. It sort of sounds like it, but it's not really, from our perspective, a competitive thing. We want to focus on this big picture, and that's, <coughs> and that's, that's quite a bit different than most of the other projects, which are really focusing on MANO, the Etsy MANO for virtualized network functions. If you could take, I'm sorry, we are running a little bit late. If you could take that off, okay, offline for that question. But thank you, Mark. Well, thank you.